Chapter 20 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase, Chapter 20 At the Country Club. The Country Club, when I walked up its lawn, was noisy with the hammering and jawing of its decoration committee. Out in the glass belvedere, like superior goods on display, taking it easy while everyone else worked, I saw a group of young matrons of the smart set, Ina Vanneman among them, drinking tea. The open play she was making at Worth troubled me a little. He was the silent kind that keeps you guessing. She'd landed him once. What was to hinder her being successful with the same tactics, whatever they'd been, a second time? Then I saw Edward's car was still out in the big crescent driveway, showing by the drift of twigs and petals on its running board that it had been used to bring in tree blooms from his ranch. The man himself crossed the veranda, and I hailed. Any place inside where you and I could have a private word together? I I think so, Boyne, he hesitated. Come on back here. He led me straight across the big assembly room, which was being trimmed for the ball. From the top of a stepladder, Skeet Thornhill yelled to us, Where are you two going? Come back here and get on the job. She had a dozen noisy assistants. I waved at her from the further door as we ducked. Strange that honest, sound little thing should be own sister to the dull-faced vamp out there in the showcase. Edwards made for a little writing room at the end of a corridor. I followed his long, nervous stride. If the man had been goaded to the shooting of Thomas Gilbert, it would have been an act of passion, and by passion he would betray himself. When I had him alone, the door shut, I went to it, told him we knew that death was murder, not suicide, and that the crime had been committed early Saturday night. Before I could connect him with it, he broke in on me. Is Worth suspected? Not by me, I said, and by God, not by you, Edwards. You know better than that. I held his eye, but read nothing beyond what might have been the flare of quick anger for the boy's sake. Who, then? he said. Who's dared to lisp a word like that? That hound Cummings, chasing around Santa Isabel with Bowman, is that where it comes from? I told Worth the fellow was knifing him in the back. He began to stride up and down the room. The boy's got other friends. That'll go their length for him. I'm with him till hell freezes over. You can count on me. Exactly what I wanted to find out. I cut in, so significantly that he whirled at the end of his bead and stared. Meaning? Meaning, you are the one man who could clear Worth Gilbert of all suspicion. What do you know? The big voice had come down to a mere whisper. Plenty of passion now, a passion of terror. I spoke quickly. We know you were in the study that night with a companion and I piled out the worst of his affair as I'd read it in the diaries, winding up, "'Plain what brought you there. Quarrel? Motive? Don't need to look any further.' Before I was done, Jim Edwards had groped over to a chair and slumped into it. A queer, toneless voice asked, "'Worth sent you to me, a detective, with this?' "'No,' I said. "'I'm acting on my own.' "'And against his will?' It came back instantly. "'What of it?' I demanded. "'Are you the coward to take advantage of his sense of honor, to let his generosity cost him his life?' "'His life?' That landed. Watching, I saw the struggle that tore him. He jumped up and started toward me. I had much doubt that I was now going to hear a plea for mercy, a confession of sorts, as he stopped, dropped his head, and stood scowling at the floor. "'Talk,' I said. Spill it. Now's your time." He raised his eyes to mine, and spoke suddenly. "'Boyne, I have nothing to say. And Worth Gilbert can hang and be damned to him, is that it?' I took another step toward him. "'No, Edwards, that nothing-to-say stuff won't go in a court of law. It won't get you anywhere. They'll never in the world try Worth for that killing. I'm expecting his arrest any hour. A trial? Those cursed diaries of Tom's brought into court. My God! I believe if I'd known he'd written things like that, I could have killed him for it." I stared. 
he had forgotten me, but at this speech I mentally dropped him for the moment and fastened my suspicions on the woman who went with him to the study. "'All right,' I said brutally. "'You didn't kill Thomas Gilbert, but you took Mrs. Bowman to the study that night to have it out with him and get six pages from the 1916 book. She got him, and you know what she had to do to get him.' "'Hold on, Boyne,' he said sternly. "'Don't you talk like that to me.' Well, I said, Mrs. Bowman was there, after those diary leaves. I heard Barbara Wallace imitate her voice, and Chung recognized the imitation. You know, that night at the study, the first night. He took a bewildered moment or two for thought, then broke out. It wasn't Laura's voice Barbara imitated. Did she say so? No, but she imitated the voice of a woman who came weeping to get those pages from the diary, and who else would that be? Who else would want them? You're off the track, Boyne. He drew a great, shuddering sigh of relief. Tom was always playing the tyrant to those about him. No doubt some woman did come crying for that stuff, but it wasn't Laura. By heaven! I exclaimed as I looked at him. You know who it was. You recognized the voice that night, but the woman isn't one you're interested in. I'm interested in all women, so far as they're getting a decent show in the world is concerned," he maintained sturdily. I'd go as far as any man to defend the good name of a woman, whether I thought much of her or not. This other woman, I argued, not any too keen on such a job myself, hasn't she got some man to speak for her? Edwards looked at me innocently. She didn't have, then, he began, and I finished for him. But she has now. I've got it!" As I jumped up and hurried to the door, his eyes followed me in wonder. There I turned with, "'Stay right where you are. I'll be back in a minute.' I ducked out into the hall and signaled a passing messenger, then stepped quickly back into the writing-room and said, "'I've sent for Bronson Vandeman.' He settled deeper in his chair with, "'I'll stay and see it out. If you get anything from Vandeman, I miss my guess.' End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Million Dollar Suitcase。Chapter 21 A Matter of Taste。Upon our few moments of strained waiting, Vanneman breezed in, full of apologies for his shirt sleeves. I remember noticing the monogram worked on the left silken arm, the fit and swing of immaculate trousers, as smoothly modeled to the hip as a girl's gown, his ever-smiling face, the slightly exaggerated way he wiped fingers already clean on a handkerchief pulled from a rear pocket. He was the only unconstrained person in the room. He hardly looked surprised. His glance was merely inquiring. Edwards apparently couldn't stand it. He jumped up and began his characteristic pacing of one end of the constricted place, jerking out as he walked. "'Bronce, it's my fault that Boyne sent for you. He's working on this trouble of worse, you know. He's had me in here, grilling me, shaking me over hell, and something I said, God knows why, sent him after you.' "'Trouble of worse?' Vanderman had been about to sit. His half-bent knee straightened out again. He stood beside the chair and spoke irritably. "'Told you, Boyne, if you meddled with that coroner's verdict you'd get your employer in the devil of a tight place. Nobody had any reason for wanting Worth's father out of the way, except Worth himself. Frankly, I think you're wrong. But everything that I can do, of course—' "'All right,' I said, letting it fly at him. "'Where was your wife from seven to half-past nine on the evening of Gilbert's murder?' back went his head, out flashed all the fine teeth. The man laughed in my face. "'Excuse me, Mr. Boyne. I understand that this is serious, nothing funny about it. But really, you know, recalling the date, what you've said is amusing. My dear man,' he went on as I stared at him, "'please remember yourself where Ina was on that particular evening. The wedding and reception were done with by seven o'clock,' I objected this ground was familiar with me. I'd been over it in considering what opportunity Laura Bowman would have had for a call on Thomas Gilbert at the required hour. If she could slip away for it, 
Why not Ina Vandeman? As though he read my thoughts and answered them, Vandeman filled in. A bride, you know, is dead certain to have at least half a dozen persons with her every minute of the time until she leaves the house on her wedding trip. Ina did, I'm sure. We'll just call her in, and she'll give you their names." He was up and starting to bring her. I stopped him. We'll not bother with those names just now. I'd rather have you, or Mrs. Vandeman, tell me what you suppose would be the entry in Thomas Gilbert's diary for May 31 and June 1, 1916. I have already identified it as the date on which the Bowmans first moved into the Wallace house. I think Mr. Edwards knows something more, but he's not so communicative as you promised to be." He looked as if he wished he hadn't been so liberal with his assurances. I saw him glance half sulkily at Edwards, as he exclaimed, "'But those diaries are burned! They're burned! Worth told us the other night that he burned them without reading!' At the words, Edwards stopped stock still something almost humorous at the back of the suffering gaze he fastened on my face. I met it steadily, then answered Vandeman. "'Does it make any difference to anybody that those books are burned? I'd read them. I know what was in them, and I know that three leaves, six pages, covering the entries of May 31 and June 1, 1916, were cut out.' "'But what the deuce, Boyne?' Vandeman wrinkled a smooth brow. What would some leaves gone from Mr. Gilbert's diary four years ago have to do with us here today, or even with his recent death? Pardon me, I said shortly. The matter's not as old as that. True, the stuff was written four years ago. It recorded happenings on those dates. But the ink that was used in marking out a runover on the next following page was fresh. Anyhow, Mr. Vanneman, we know that a woman came weeping to Mr. Gilbert on the very night of his death only a short time before his death, as nearly as medical science can determine that, and we believe that she came after those leaves out of the diary and got them, whatever she had to do to secure them." I was struck with the difference in the way these two men took inquiry. Edwards had writhed, changed color, started to speak and caught himself back, showed all the agony of a clumsy criminal who dreads the probing that may give him away. Temperament, the rotten spot in his affairs. Vanneman, younger, not entangled with an unhappy married woman, sat looking me in the eye, still smiling. The blow I had to deal him would be harder. It concerned his bride, but he'd take punishment well. I proceeded to let him have it. I can see that Mr. Edwards has an idea what the entries on those pages covered. He has inadvertently shown me that your wife was the woman who came and got them from Thomas Gilbert on the night he was murdered. At that he turned on Edwards, and Edwards answered the look with, "'I didn't. On my honor, Bronze, I never mention your name or Ina's. The Chinaman told him that, about some woman coming that evening.' "'Mr. Vanneman,' I broke in, "'there's no use beating about the bush. Chung recognized your wife's voice. She was the woman who came weeping to get those diary leaves.' He took that with astonishing quietness, and— Suppose you were shown that she wasn't out of her mother's house. Wouldn't stop me. Allow that her alibi's perfect. Yet you men have something. There's something here I ought to know. Something you'll never find out from me." Jim Edwards' deep voice was full of defiance. Bronze, I owe you an apology, but you can depend on me to keep my mouth shut. After a minute's consideration, Vandeman said, I don't know why we should any of us keep our mouths shut." Jim Edwards looked utterly bewildered as the man sat there, thinking the thing over, glanced up pleasantly at me, and suggested, "'Edwards has a little different slant on this from me. I don't know why I shouldn't state to you exactly what happened, right there in Gilbert's study on the date you mentioned. Oh, there did something unusual happen, and you've just remembered it.' There did something unusual happen, and I've just remembered it, aided there, too, by your questions and Edward's queer looks. Cheer up, old man. We haven't all got your southern chivalry. From a plain, common-sense point of view, what I have to tell is not in the least to my wife's discredit. In fact, I'm proud of her all the way through." Jim Edwards came suddenly and nervously to his feet strode to the further corner of the room, and sat down at as great a distance from Vandeman as its dimensions would permit. 
He turned his face to the small window there, and through all that Vanneman said, kept up a steady, maddening tattoo with his fingernails on the sill. This has to do with what I told you the first night I ever talked with you, Boyne. You threw doubt on Thomas Gilbert's death being suicide. I gave as a reason for my belief that it was, a knowledge and conviction that the man's mind was unhinged." Edward's tattoo at the window ceased for a minute. He stared, startled, at the speaker, then went back to it, and Vanderman proceeded. "'I'm not telling Jim Edwards anything he doesn't know, and what I say to you, Boyne, that's discreditable to the dead, I can't avoid. Here it is. On the evening of June 1st, 1916, I had dinner alone at home. You'll find, if you look at an old calendar, that it falls on a Sunday. Jim Edwards had dined informally at the Thornhills. As he told it to me later, they were all sitting out on the side porch after dinner, and nobody noticed that Ina wasn't with them until they heard cries coming from somewhere over in the direction of the Gilbert place. At my house I'd heard it, and we both ran for the garage, where the screams were repeated again and again. We got there about the same time found the disturbance was in the study, and Edwards, who was ahead of me, rushed up and hammered on its door. Again Jim Edwards stopped the nervous drumming of his fingers on the window-sill, while he stared at the younger man as at some prodigy of nature. Finally he seemed unable to hold in any longer. "'Hammered on the door,' he repeated. "'If you're going to turn out the whole damn thing to Boyne, tell it straight. Door was open.' We couldn't have heard a yip out of Ina if it hadn't been. Tom there in full sight, sitting in his desk chair, cool as a cucumber, letting her scream. I'm telling this, Vanderman snapped. Gilbert looked to me like an insane man. Jim, you're crazy as he was to say anything else. Never supposed for a minute you thought otherwise. That poor girl there, dazed with fright, backed as far away from him as she could get, hair flying, eyes wild. I looked from one to the other. What Edwards had said of the cold, contemptuous old man, what Vanneman told of the screaming girl. No answer to such a proposition, of course, but an attempted frame-up. To let the bridegroom get by would best serve my purpose. "'All right, gentlemen,' I said. "'And now could you tell me what action you took on this state of affairs?' "'Action?' Vanneman gave me an uneasy look. "'What was there to do?' told you I thought the man was crazy. And you, Edwards? Let it go as Braunt says. I cut back to Mrs. Thornhill's, scouting to see what the chance was for getting Ina in without the family knowing anything. That's right, Vanderman said. I stayed to fetch her. She was fine. To the last, she let Gilbert save his face, actually send her home as though she were the one to blame. Right then I knew I loved her, wanted her for my wife. On the way home I asked her and was accepted. In spite of the fact that she was engaged to Worth Gilbert? Boyne, he said impatiently, what's the matter with you? Haven't I made you understand what happened there at the study? She had to break off with the son of a man like that. Ina Thornhill couldn't marry into such a breed. Slow up, Vanderman. Edward's tone was soft, but when I looked at him I saw a tawny spark in his black eyes. Vanham fronted him with the flamboyant embroidered monogram on his shirt-sleeve, the carefully careless tie, the utterly good clothes, and, most of all, at the moment, the smug satisfaction in his face of social and human security. I thought of what that Frenchman says about there being nothing so enjoyable to us as the troubles of our friends. Needn't think you can put it all over the boy when he's not here to defend himself, jump on him because he's down. Tell that your wife discarded him, cast him off, for disgraceful reasons. Damn it all! You and I both heard Tom giving her orders to break with his son, she sniffling and hunting hairpins over the floor and promising that she would. "'Cut it out!' yelled Vanderman, as though someone had pinched him. "'I saw nothing of the sort. I heard nothing of the sort. Neither did you.' I think they had forgotten me, and that they remembered at about the same instant that they were talking before a detective. They both turned, mum and startled-looking, Edwards to his window, Vanneman to a nervous brushing of his trouser-edges, from which he looked up, inquiring doubtfully. "'What next, Boyne? Jim's excited. 
but you understand that there's no animus, and my wife and I are entirely at your disposal in this matter. Thank you, I said. Would you like to talk to her? I would. When? Now. Where? Here, or let the lady say. Vanderman gave me a queer look and went out. When he was gone, I found Jim Edwards scrabbling for his hat where it had dropped over behind the desk. I put my back against the door and asked, Is Bronson Vanderman a fatuous fool, or does he take me for one? Some men defend their women one way, and some another. Let me out of this, Boyne, before that girl gets here. She won't come in a hurry, I smiled. Her husband's pretty free with his promises, but more than likely I'll have to go after her if I want her. Well? He looked at me uncomfortably. Blackmail's a crime, you know, Edwards. A woman capable of it might be capable of murder. You've got the wrong word there, Boyne. This wasn't exactly blackmail. What then? The girl. I never liked her, never thought she was good enough for worth, but she was engaged to him, and in this I think she was fighting for her hand. He searched my face and went on cautiously. You read the diaries. They must have had complaints of her. They had, I assented. Anything about money? I shook my head. You said there were two entries gone. The first would have told you, I suppose. Before we go further, Boyne, let me make a little explanation to you, for the girl's sake. Shoot, I said. It was this way, he sighed. Thornhill, Ina's father, made fifteen or twenty thousand a year, I would say, and the family lived it up. He had a stroke and died in a week's time. Left Mrs. Thornhill with her daughters, her big house, her fine social position, and might a little to keep it up on. Ina is the eldest. She got the worst of it, because at the first of her being a young lady she was used to having all the money she wanted to spend. The twins were right on her heels. The thing for her to do was to make a good marriage and make it quick. But she got engaged to Worth. Then he went to France. There you were. He might never come back. Tom always hated her, watched her like a hawk, got on to something she, about— Out with it, I said. What? Come down to cases. Money. He uttered the one word and stood silent. I made a long shot with— Mr. Gilbert found she'd been getting money from other men. Borrowing, Boyne. They use the word borrowed, Edwards put in. It was always Tom's way to summon people as though he had a little private judgment bar, haul them up and lecture them. I suppose he thought he had a special license in her case. And she went prepared to frame him and bluff him to a standoff. Is that the way you saw it? My opinion, what I might think, said Mr. James Edwards of Sunnyvale Ranch, wouldn't be testimony in a court of law. You don't want it, Boyne. Maybe not, I grunted. Perhaps I could make as good a guess as you could at what young Mrs. Vanderman's capable of, a dolly face, and behind it the courage of hell. Boyne, he said, as I left the door free to him, quit making war on women. Can't, I grinned and waved him on out. The detective business would be a total loss without him. End of chapter 21《Chapter 22 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 22. A Dinner Invitation. Look what's after you, man, Skeet warned me from her lofty perch as I went out through the big room in quest of Ina Vanderman. Better you stay here. I give you a yob. Lot safer. Only run the risk of getting your neck broken. I grinned up into her jolly, freckled face, and waited for the woman who came toward me with that elastic, swingy movement of hers, the well-opened eyes studying me, keeping all their secrets behind them. "'Mr. Boyne,' a hand on my arm guided me to a side door. We stepped together out onto a small balcony that led to the lawn. "'My husband brought me your message. Nobody over by the tennis court. Let's go and walk up and down there.' Her fingers remained on my sleeve as we moved off. She emphasized her points from time to time by a slight pressure. 
Such a relief to have a man like you in charge of this investigation." She gave me an intimate smile. Tall as she was, her face was almost on a level with my own, yet I still found her eyes unreadable, none of those quick tremors under the skin that register the emotions of excitable humanity. She remained a handsome, perfectly groomed, and entirely unruffled young woman. Thank you, was all I said. Mr. Vanderman and I understand how very, very serious this is. Of course, now, neighbors and intimates of Mr. Gilbert are under inspection. Everybody's private affairs are liable to be turned out. We've all got to take our medicine. No use feeling personal resentment. Fine, but she'd have done better to keep her hands off me. An old police detective knows too much of the class of women who use that lever. I looked at them now white, delicate, many-ringed, much more expressive than her face, and I thought them capable of anything. "'Here are the names you'll want,' she fumbled in the girdle of her gown, brought out a paper and passed it over. "'These are the ones who stayed after the reception, went up to my room with me, and helped me change, or rather hindered me.' "'The ones,' I didn't open the paper yet, just looked at her across it, who were with you all the time from the reception till you left the house for San Francisco?" "'It's like this,' again she smiled at me. "'The five whose names are on that paper, might any one of them have been in and out of my room during the time? I can't say as to that. But they can swear that I wasn't out of the room, because I wasn't dressed. As soon as I changed from my wedding gown to my traveling suit, I went downstairs and we were all together till we drove to San Francisco and supper at Tate's, where I had the pleasure of meeting you, Mr. Boyne." "'I understand,' I said. They could all speak for you, but you couldn't speak for them. Then I opened and looked. Some list. The social and financial elect of Santa Isabel. Bankers' ladies, prune king's daughters, persons you couldn't doubt or buy but at the top of all was Laura Bowman's name. We had halted for the turn at the end of the court. I held the paper before her. "'How about this one? Do you think she was in the room all the time, or have you any recollection?' The bride moved a little closer and spoke low. "'Laura and the doctor were in the middle of one of their grand rows. She's a bunch of temperament. Mama was ill. The girls were having to start out with only Laura for chaperone. She said something about going somewhere, and it wouldn't take her long. She'd be back in plenty of time. But whether she went or not, Mr. Boyne, you don't want us to tell you our speculations and guesses. That wouldn't be fair, would it?" It wouldn't hurt anything, I countered. I'll only make use of what can be proven. Anything you say is safe with me. Well, then, of course, you know all about the situation between Laura and Jim Edwards. Laura was determined she wouldn't go up to San Francisco with her husband, or if she did, he must drive her back the same night. She wouldn't even leave our house to get her things from home. The doctor, poor man, packed some sort of bag for her and brought it over. When he came back with it, she wasn't to be found, and she never did appear until we were getting into the machine. I listened, glancing anxiously toward the skyline of that little hill over which Worth and Barbara might be expected to appear almost any moment now. Then we made the turn at the end of the court, and my view of it was cut off. Laura and Jim, they're the ones this is going to be hard on. I do feel sorry for them. She's always been a problem to her family and friends. A great deal's been overlooked. Everybody likes Jim. But he's a Southerner. Intrigue comes natural to them. Five minutes before, I had been listening to Edward's pitiful defense of this girl. I recalled his scouting for a chance to get her home unseen and save her standing with her family. That could be classed as intrigue, too, I suppose. We were strolling slowly toward the clubhouse. I don't give Dr. Bowman much, I said deliberately. A quick look came my way, and— Mr. Gilbert was greatly attached to him. Everybody's always believed that only Mr. Gilbert's influence held that much together. Now he's dead, and Laura's freed from some sort of control he seemed to have over her. Of course she hopes and expects she'll be able to divorce the doctor in peace and marry Jim. No movement of the sort yet? 
she stopped and faced round toward me. Dr. Bowman, he's our family physician, you know, is trying for a very fine position away from here, in an exclusive sanitarium. Divorce proceedings coming now would ruin his chances. But I don't know how long he can persuade Laura to hold off. She's in a strange mood. I can't make her out myself. She disliked Gilbert, yet his death seems to have upset her frightfully." "'You say she didn't like Mr. Gilbert?' They hated each other. But he was so peculiar, of course that wasn't strange. Many people detested him. Braun never did. He always forgave him everything because he said he was insane. Braun told you my experience, the one that made me break with Worth." She looked at me, a level look. No shifting of color, no flutter of eyelid or throat. We were at the clubhouse steps. "'Here comes the boy himself.' I warned as Worth and Barbara, their arms full of ferns, rounded the turn from the little dip at the side of the grounds where the stream went through. We stood and waited for them. "'You two, Ina spoke quickly to them. "'Mr. Boyne's just promised to come over to dinner tomorrow night.' Her glance asked me to accept the fib and the invitation. "'I want both of you.' "'I'm going to be at your house anyhow, Ina,' Barbara said working with Skeet painting those big banners they've tacked up out in your court. You'll have to feed us. But we'll be pretty messy. I don't know about a dinner party." "'It isn't,' Ina protested, smiling. "'It's just what you said, feeding you. Nobody there besides yourself and Skeet but Mr. Boyne and Worth, if he'll come.' "'I have to go up to San Francisco tomorrow,' said Worth. "'But you'll be back by dinner time," Ina added quickly if I make it at all. "'Well, you can come just as you are, if you get in at the last minute,' she said, and he and Barbara went on to carry their ferns in. When they were out of hearing, she turned and floored me with, "'Mr. Vanderman has forbidden me to say this to you, but I'm going to speak. If Worth doesn't have to be told about me, and his father, I'd be glad.' "'If the missing leaves of the diary are ever found,' I came up slowly, "'he'd probably know then.' I watched her as I said it. What a strange look of satisfaction in the little curves about her mouth as she spoke next. Those leaves will never be found, Mr. Boyne. I burned them. Mr. Gilbert presented them to me as a wedding gift. He was insane, but intending to take his own life, I think even his strangely warped conscience refused to let a lying record stand against an innocent girl who had never done him any harm. We stood silent a moment, then she looked round at me brightly with, "'You're coming to dinner tomorrow night. So glad to have you. At seven o'clock. Well, if this is all, then—' And at my nod she went up the steps, turning at the side door to smile and wave at me. What a woman! I could but admire her nerve. If her alibi proved copper-fastened, as something told me it would, I had no more hope of bringing home the murder of Thomas Gilbert to Mrs. Bronson Vanneman of Santa Isabel than I had of readjusting the stars in their courses. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase Chapter 23 A Bit of Silk I must admit that when Worth and Barbara walked up and found me talking to Ina Vanderman, I felt caught dead to rights. The girl gave me one long, steady look. I was afraid of Barbara Wallace's eyes. Then and there I relinquished all idea of having her help in this inquiry. She could have done it much better than I, attracted less attention. But no matter. The awkward moment went by, however. I heaved a sigh of relief as they carried their ferns on into the clubhouse, and Mrs. Vanderman left me with gracious goodbyes. I had the luck to cover my first inquiry by getting a lift into town for Mrs. Ormsby, young wife of the President of the First National. Alone with me in her little electric, she answered every question I cared to put, and said she would be careful to speak to no one of the matter. Three others I caught on the wing, as it were, busy at Blossom Festival affairs. 
the Fet only one day off now, things were moving fast. I glimpsed Dr. Bowman downtown and thought he rather carefully avoided seeing me. His wife was taking no part. The word went that she was not able. But when I called at what had been the Wallace and was now the Bowman home, I found the front door open and two ladies in the hall. One of them, Laura Bowman herself, came flying out to meet me, or rather it seemed to stop me with a face of dismay. "'My mother's here, Mr. Boyne.' Her hand was clammy cold. She'd been warned of me and my errand. "'I don't want to take you through that way.' I stood passive and let her do the saying. "'Around here,' she faltered. "'We can go in at the side door.' We skirted the house by a narrow walk. She was leading the way by this other entrance, when, spread out over its low step blocking our progress, I saw a small Japanese woman ripping up a satin dress. "'Let us pass, Umi.' "'Wait, we can talk as well here,' I checked her. We moved on a few paces, out of earshot of the girl, but before I could put my questions she began with a sort of shattered vehemence to protest that Thomas Gilbert's death was suicide. "'It was, Mr. Boyne. Anybody who knew the scourge Thomas had been to those he must have loved in his queer, distorted way, and any one who loved them, could believe he might take his own life.' "'You speak freely, Mrs. Bowman,' I said. "'Then you hated the man?' "'Oh, I did. For years past I've never heard of a death without wondering that God took other human beings and let him live. Now that he's killed himself it seems dreadful to me that suspicion should be cast on—' "'Mrs. Bowman,' I interrupted. "'Thomas Gilbert's death was murder. All persons who could have had motive or might have had opportunity to kill him will be under suspicion till the investigation clears them of it. I am now ascertaining the whereabouts of Ina Vanneman that evening." A shudder went through her. She looked at me feelingly, twisting her hands together in the way I remembered. Despite her distress, she was very simple and accessible. She gave me no resistance admitted her absence from the Thornhill house at about the time the party was ready to start for San Francisco. Edwards, of course. I got nothing new here. She seemed thankful enough to go into the house when I released her. I lingered a moment to have a word with the little Japanese woman on the step. "'How long you work this place?' Two hours afternoon, every day,' ducking and giggling like a mechanical toy. "'Just a peace-worker, not a regular servant.' pretty dress. I touched the satin on the step. Whose? Mine. Grinning, she spread a breath out over her knees. Lady no like any more. Mine. It was a peculiar shade of peacock blue, unless I was mistaken, the one Mrs. Bowman had worn that night at Tate's. Hello, what's this? I bent to examine a small hole in the hem of that breath Umi was so delightedly smoothing. Oh! I think may may burn em. Not like any more." There was a small round hole, just so a cigarette might have seared, or a bullet. "'Not can use,' I said to Umi, indicating the injured bit. "'Cut that off. Give me.' And I laid a silver dollar on the step. Giggling, the little brown woman snipped out the bit of hem and handed it to me. I glanced up from tucking it into my pocket and saw Laura Bowman's white face staring at me through the glass of that side entry door. A suggestive lead, certainly, but it's my way to follow one lead at a time. I went on to the Thornhill place. Everybody there would know my errand, for though, with taste I could but admire, Ina had put no name of any member of the family on her list, she, of course, expected me to call on them, and would never have let her sisters leave the country club without a warning. The three were just taking their hats off in the hall when I arrived. I did my questioning there, not troubling to take them separately. Cora and Ernestine, a well-bred pair of Inas, without her pep, perhaps a shade less good-looking, made their replies with none of the usual flutter of feminine curiosity and excitement, then went on in the living-room. Skeet, of course, was as practical and brief as a sensible boy. "'I don't know whether she's fit to see you.' she said when I spoke of her mother, and on the instant Ina Vandeman's clear, high voice came down the stair. "'Bring Mr. Boyne up, now!' Skeet stepped aside for me to pass. 
I suppose I looked as startled as I felt, for on my way to the house I had seen Mrs. Vanderman drive past toward town. I stood there at a loss, and finally said, aimlessly, "'Your sister thinks it's all right?' "'My sister?' Skeet wrinkled her brows at me and glanced to where the twins were in sight in the living room. "'That was Mother herself who called you.' All the way up the stairs, Skeet following, I was trying to swing my rather heavy wits around to take advantage of this new development. So far, Ina Vandeman's voice, imitated by Barbara Wallace and recognized by Chung and Jim Edwards, possibly by Worth, had been my lead in this direction. If more than one woman spoke in that voice, where would it take me? I got no adjustment before I was ushered into a large dim room and confronted by a figure in a reclining chair by the window. Here, in spite of years and illness, were the same good looks and thoroughbred courage that seemed to characterize the women of this family. Mrs. Thornhill greeted me in Ina Vandeman's very tones, a little high-pitched for real sweetness, full of a dominating quality, and she showed a composure I had not expected. To Skeet, standing by, watching to see that her mother didn't overdo in talking to me, she said, "'Dear, go downstairs. Jane's left her dinner on the range and gone to the grocery. You look after it while she's away.' When we were alone, she lay back in her chair, eyes closed, or seemingly so, and made her statement. She'd been in her daughter's room only twice between the reception and that daughter's going away. "'But the room was full of other people.' a glimmer between lashes. I could give you the names of those others. Thank you, I said. Mrs. Vanderman has already done that. I've seen them all. You've seen them all? A long, furtively drawn breath. Then her eyes flashed open and fixed themselves on me. Relief was there, yet something stricken, as they traveled over me from my gray thatch to my big feet. Now, Mrs. Thornhill, I said, Aside from those two visits to your daughter's room, where were you that evening?" A slow flush crept into her thin cheeks. The unreadable eyes that were traveling over Jerry Boyne stopped suddenly and held him with a quiet stare. "'I understood it was my daughter's movements on that evening you wished to trace, Mr. Boyne,' she said slowly. "'It would be difficult to trace mine. Really, I had so much on my hands with the reception and inefficient help she broke off, her eyes never leaving my own, even as she added smoothly, "'It would be very, very difficult.' There is an effect in class almost like the distinction of race. These women spoke a baffling language. Their psychology was hard for me. If there was something hid up amongst them that ought to be uncovered by diplomacy and delicate indirection, it would take a smarter man than the one who stood in my number tens to do it. Mrs. Thornhill, I said, you did leave the house. You went to Mr. Gilbert's study. The shot that killed him left you a nervous wreck, so that you couldn't hear a tire blow out without reenacting in your mind the scene of that murder. You'll talk now. You think I will? Talk to you? Very low and quiet, eyes once more closed. Why not? It's got to come, here in your own home, with me, or I'll have to put you where you'll be forced to answer questions. Oh, you threaten me, do you?" Her eyes flashed open and looked at me, hard as flint. Very well. I'll answer no questions as to what happened on the evening of Thomas Gilbert's death, except in the presence of Worth Gilbert, his son. My retirement down the Thornhill stairs, made with such dignity as I could muster, was in fact a panic flight. Halfway, Cora Thornhill all but finished me by looking out from the living room and calling in Ina Vandeman's voice, Ernie, show Mr. Boyne out, won't you?" Ernestine completed the job when she answered, in Ina Vandeman's voice also. "'Yes, dear, I will.' It was only the scraps of me that she swept out through the front door. I stood on the porch and mopped my brow. Across, there at the Gilbert place, was Worth himself, charging around the grounds with Vandeman and a lot of other decorators, pruning shears in hand going for a thicket of bamboos that shut off the vegetable garden. At one side, Barbara stood alone, looking, it seemed to me, rather depressed. I made for her. She met me with, "'I know what you've been doing. Skeet came to me about it while Ina was phoning home from the country club.' 
Well, she should worry. I've just finished with her list. Got an unbreakable alibi. She would have, Barbara said listlessly. She wasn't at the study that evening. Huh. I worked on your tip that she was. Barbara had pulled off the little stitched hat she wore, yet the deep flush on her cheeks was neither from sun nor an afternoon's hard work. It and the quick straightening of her figure, the lift of her chin, had to do with me and my activities. Mr. Boyne, the black eyes came around to me with a flash, do you suspect me of trying to pay off a spite on Ina Vanderman? Good Lord, no! I exploded. And anyhow, I've just found that what you imitated and Chung recognized might as well have been the mother's voice as the daughter's. Yes, she assented. Any one of the family, under stress of emotion. Then suddenly, and why do I tell you that? You'll not get it from what I do. I ought never to have mixed up my kind of mental work with other people's. I'd promised my own soul that I would never make another deduction. Then Worth came and asked me, that night at Tate's. I might say now that I never will any more. She broke off, storm in her eyes and in her voice as she finished. But I suppose if he wanted me to again, I'd make a little fool of myself for his amusement, just as I did this time and have done all those other times. I'll not ask anything more of you, Barbara, I said to her hastily, confused and abashed before the glimpse she'd given me of her heart. Except that I beg you to stay good friends with Cummings. That man hates Worth. If you turned him down now, say for the ball or anything like that, he'd be twice as hard for us to handle. Keep him a passive enemy instead of an active one, as long as he seems to find it necessary to hang around Santa Isabel. You know what's holding Mr. Cummings here, don't you?" She glanced somberly past the bamboo-gatherers to where we saw a gray corner of the study with its pink ivy geranium blossoms atop. Mr. Cummings is held here by two steel bolts, the bolts on those study doors. Until he finds how they can be moved through an inch of planking, he'll not leave Santa Isabel. She'd put it in a nutshell and I couldn't let him beat me to it. I'd got to get the jump on him. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase Chapter 24 The Magnet I had all set for next morning, my roadster at Cape Hearts for repair, old Bill tipped off that I didn't want anyone but Eddie Hughes to work on it, and to add to my satisfaction, there arrived in my daily grist from the office the report that they had skeels in jail at Tijuana. "'Well, Jerry, old socks,' Worth hailed my news as I followed out to his car where he was starting for San Francisco, and going to drop me at the Cape Heart garage. "'Some luck!' If Skeels is in jail at Tijuana, and what I'm after today turns out right, we may have both ends of the string." Pink and white were the miles of orchards surrounding Santa Isabel, pink and white nearly all the dooryards, every tree its own little carnival of bloom with bees for guests. Already the streets were full of life, double the usual traffic. As we neared the Cape Heart Cottage, on its quiet side street about a half a block from the garage, there was Barbara under the apple boughs at the gate, talking to some man whose back was to us. She bowed. I answered with a wave toward the garage, but Worth scooted us past without, I thought, once glancing her way, sent the roadster across Main where he should have stopped and let me out, went on and into the highway at a clip which rocked us. Was that Cummings? Holding my hat on. No answer that I could hear while we made speed toward San Francisco. And still no word was spoken until we had outraged the sensibilities of all whose bad luck it was to meet us, those whom we passed going at a mere reasonable pace, scared a team of workhorses into the ditch and settled down to a steady whiz. We were getting away from Santa Isabel a good deal further and a good deal faster than I felt I could afford. 
I took a chance and remarked, to nobody in particular and in a loud voice, I asked Barbara not to make a break with Cummings. It would be awkward for us now if she did. Break? Worth gave me back one of my words. Yes, I was afraid she might throw him down for the carnival ball. Without comment or reply, he slowed gently for the big turn where the Medlow Road comes in, swept a handsome circle and headed back. Then he remarked, "'Thought I'd show you what the little boat could do under my management. Eddie had her in fair shape, but I've tuned her up a notch or two since.' I responded with proper enthusiasm and would have been perfectly willing to be let out at Main Street. But he turned the corner there, ran on to the garage, jumped out and followed me in. Bill, selling some used tires to a customer in the office, nodded and let us go past to where my machine stood. We heard voices back in the repair shop and a hum of swift whirring shafts and pulleys. Worth kept with me. It embarrassed me, made me nervous. It was as though he had some notion of my purpose there. Hughes, at his lathe, caught sight of us and growled over his shoulder, "'Your machine's ready.' This wouldn't do. I stepped to the door with, "'Fix the radiator, did you?' "'Sure. What'd you think?' Hughes was at work on something for a girl. She perched at one end of his bench, swinging her feet. Worth, behind me, touched my shoulder, and I saw that the girl over there was Barbara Wallace. She looked up at us and smiled. The sun slanting through dirt-covered windows made color effects on her silken black hair. Eddie gave us another scowl and went on with his work. "'Hello, Bobs.' Worth's greeting was casual. "'Thought I'd stop and tell you I was on my way, you know.' A glance of understanding passed between them. "'Better come along?' "'I'd like to,' she smiled. "'You'll be back by dinner time. If it wasn't the last day, and I hadn't promised—' Neither of them in any hurry. "'Hughes,' I said, "'there's another thing needs doing on that car of mine. Can't do nothing at all till I finish her job.' He shrugged me off. "'All right,' and I stepped through into the grassy backyard, put a smoke in my face, and began walking up and down, my glance, each time I turned, encountering that queer bunch inside. Worth, hands in pockets, the chauffeur he had discharged, and that I was waiting to get for murder, bending at his vice, Barbara's shining dark head close to the tousled unkemptness of his pole, as she explained to him the pulley arrangement needed to raise and anchor the banner she and Skeet were painting. Suddenly, at the far end of my beat, I was brought up by a little outcry and stir. As I wheeled toward the door, I saw Bob's and Worth in it apparently wrestling over something. Laughing, crying, she hung to his wrist with one hand and the other covering one of her eyes. "'Let me look,' he demanded. "'I won't touch it, if you don't want me to. You have got something in there, Bobs.' But when she reluctantly gave him his chance, he treacherously went for her with a corner of his handkerchief in the traditional way, and she backed off, uttering a cry that fetched Hughes around from the lathe, roaring at Worth, above the noise of the machinery. "'What's the matter with her?' "'Steel splinter! In her eye!' Worth shouted. With a quick oath, the belt pole was thrown to stop the lathe. Down the length of the shop to the scrap heap of odds and ends at the rear Hughes raced, returning with a bit of metal in his hand. Barbara was backed against the bench, her eyes shut, and tears had begun to flow from under the lids. "'Now, Miss Barbie,' Hughes remonstrated. You let me at that thing. This'll pull it out and never touch you. I saw it was a horseshoe magnet he carried. Do you think it will? Sure, and Eddie approached the magnet to her face. It won't hurt you at all. She'll begin to pull before she even touches. Now steady. Want to come as near contact as I can. Don't jump. Hell! Barbara had sprung away from him but for Worth's quick arm she would have been into the machines. No, she said between locked teeth, tears on her cheeks. I can't let him. Why, Barbara, I said, astonished, and poor Eddie almost blubbered as he begged. Oh, come on, Miss Barbie. It was my fault in the first place, leaving that damn lathe run. You got to let me. But if it doesn't work. 
Sure it'll work. Would I offer to use it for you if I hadn't tried it out lots of times, to pull splinters and—' "'Give me that magnet.' Worth reached the long arm of authority, got what he wanted, shouldered Hughes aside, and took hold of the girl with, "'Quit being a little fool, Barbara. That thing's only caught in your lashes now. Let it get in against the eyeball and you'll have trouble. Hold still.' The command was not needed. Without a word, Barbara raised her face, put her hands behind her, and waited. Delicately, Worth caught the dark fringe of the closed eye, turned back the lid so that he could see just what he was at, brought the horseshoe almost in touch, then drew it away. And there was the tiny steel splinter that could have cost her sight, clinging to the magnet's edge. "'Here you are,' he smiled. "'Wasn't that enough to call you names for?' You didn't call me names," dabbing away with a small handkerchief. You told me to quit being a little fool. Maybe I will. How would you like that?" Apparently, Hughes did not resent Barbara's refusing his help and accepting Worth's. He went back to his vice. The two others strolled together through the doorway into the garage, talking there for a moment in quick, low tones. Then Barbara returned to perch on the end of Eddie's bench play with the magnet and watch him at work. I lit up again and stepped out. I could see Barbara gather some nails, screws, and loose pieces of iron, hold a bit of board over them, and trail the magnet back and forth along its top. Though a half-inch of wood intervened, the metal trash on the bench followed the magnet to and fro. I got nothing out of that except that Barbara was still a child, playing like a child, till I looked up suddenly to find that she had ceased the play, brought her feet up to curl them under her in the familiar Buddha pose, while the busy hands were dropped and folded before her. Her rebellion of yesterday evening, and now her taking up the concentration unasked, she wouldn't want me to notice what she was doing. I ducked out of sight. I had walked up and down that yard a half-dozen times more, when over me with a rush came the significance of those moving bits of iron trailing a magnet on the other side of a board. Three long steps took me to the door. "'Hughes!' I shouted. "'I'm taking my machine now. Be back directly.' The man grunted without turning around. I had forgotten Barbara, but as I was climbing into the roadster, I heard her jump to the floor and start after me. "'Mr. Boyne! Wait! Mr. Boyne!' I checked and sat grinning as she came up, the magnet in her hand. I reached for it. "'Give me that,' I whispered. "'Want to go along and see me use it?' "'No, no,' in hushed protest. "'You're making a mistake, Mr. Boyne.' "'Mistake? I saw what you did in there. Said you never would again, then went right to it. You sure got something this time. Girl, girl, you've turned the trick.' "'Oh, no! You mustn't take it like that, Mr. Boyne.' This is nothing, as it stands, just a single unrelated fact that I used with others to concentrate on. Wait, do wait, till Worth comes back, anyhow." All right. I felt that our voices were getting loud, that we talked here too long. No use of flushing the game before I was loaded. First thing to do is verify this. I felt good all over. Yes, of course. She smiled faintly. You would want to do that." And she climbed in beside me. I drove so fast that Barbara had no chance to question me, though she did find openings for remonstrating at my speed. I dashed into the driveway of the Gilbert place and came to an abrupt stop at the doors of the garage. And right away I bumped up against my first check. I gripped the magnet, raced to the study door with it, she following more slowly to watch while I passed it along the wooden panel where the bolt ran on the other side. And nothing doing. Again she followed as I ran around to the outside door, opened up and tried it on the bare bolt itself. No stir. While she sat in the desk chair at that central table, her elbows on its top, her hands lightly clasped, the chin dropped in interlaced fingers, following my movements with very little interest, I puffed and worked, opened a door and tried to move the bolt when it wasn't in the socket and felt like cursing in disappointment. A little oil, I grumbled, more to myself than to her, 
and hurried to the garage workbench for the can that would certainly be there. It was, but I didn't touch it. What I did lean over and clutch from where they lay tossed in carelessly among rubbish and old spare parts were three more magnets exactly the same as the one we had brought from Caparts. I sprinted back with them. Barbara, I called in an undertone, come here, look. Held side by side, the four, working as one, moved the bolts as well as fingers could have done, and through more than an inch of hard wood. Yes, she looked at it, but that doesn't prove Eddie Hughes the murderer. No? Her opposition began to get on my nerves. I'm afraid that'll be a matter for twelve good men and true to settle. She stood silent, and I added, I know now whose shadow I saw on the broken panel of that door there the first Sunday night. Oh, it was Eddie's, she agreed rather unexpectedly. And he came to steal the 1920 diary, I supplied. He came to get a drink from the cellarette and a cigar from the case. That's the use he made of his power to move these bolts. Until the Saturday night when he killed his employer, the man he hated, and left things so the crime could pass as suicide. Barbara, are you just plain perverse? Instead of answering, she went back to the table, got the contraption Hughes had made for her, and started as if to leave me. On the threshold she hesitated. I don't suppose there's anything I can say or do to change your mind. Her tone was inert, drained. I know that Eddie is innocent of this, but you don't want to listen to deductions. Later, I said to her briskly, it'll keep. I've something to do now. What? You promised Worth to make no move against Eddie Hughes until you had his permission. She seemed to think that settled it. I let her keep the idea. Run along, Barbara, I said. Get to your paint daubing. I'll forgive you everything for deducing, well, discovering, if you like that better, about these bolts and magnets." Skeet burst from the kitchen door of the Thornhill house, caught sight of us, shouting something unintelligible, and came racing through the grounds toward Vandemans. "'Been waiting for me long, Angel?' she called as Barbara moved up with a lagging step, then, waving two pairs of overalls, "'Got pants for both of us, honey. The paints and brushes are over there. We'll make short work of that old banner now.' Promised worth, had I? but the situation was changed since then. No man of sense could object to my moving on what I had now. I locked the study door, went back to my roadster, and headed her uptown. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase Chapter 25 An Arrest It was a thankful, if not a joyous, Jerry Boyne who crossed the front pergola of the Vandeman bungalow that evening in the wake of Worth Gilbert, bound for an informal dinner. The tall, unconscious lad who stepped ahead of me had been made safe in spite of himself. This weight off my mind, I felt kindly to the whole world, to the man under whose dining table we were to stretch our legs whose embarrassing private affairs I had uncovered. He'd taken it well, seconding his wife's dinner invitation, meeting my eye frankly whenever we encountered. My mood was expansive. When Vanneman himself opened the door to us, explaining that he was his own butler for the day, I saw him quite other than he had ever appeared to me. For one thing, here in his own house, and this was the first time I had ever been in it, you got the man with his proper background, his suitable atmosphere. The handsome living room into which he took us showed many old pieces of mahogany, and some of the finest oriental stuff I ever saw. Books and cases, sets of standard writers, such as people of culture bought thirty or forty years ago, some family pictures about. This was Vandeman, a lot behind such a fellow, after all, if he did seem rather a lightweight. Ina joined us, very beautifully dressed. She also showed the ability to sink unpleasant considerations in the present moment of hospitality. We lingered a moment, chatting. Then, "'Shall we go and look at the artists working?' 
she suggested, and led the way. We followed out onto a flagged terrace at the rear. A dozen great muslin strips were tacked over the walls there, and two small figures, desperate, smudged, wearing the blue overalls Skeet Thornhill had waved at us, toiled manfully smearing the Blossom Festival colors on in lettering and ornamental designs. Ina, Skeet yawped at her sister. Another dirty low Irish trick. Get yourself all dressed up like a sore thumb, and then show us off in this fix. Mutely, Barbara revolved on the box she occupied. There was fire in her soft eyes. Her color was high as her glance came to rest on Worth. Fong Ling's nearly ready to serve dinner, said Ina calmly. Stop fussing and go wash up. Hello, Mr. Boyne. As Skeet passed me, she wiped a paw on a paint rag and offered it to me without another word. I got a grip and a look that told me there was no hangover with her from that scene yesterday in her mother's sick room. Vandeman was commenting on his depleted bamboo clumps. Mine suffered worse than yours, Worth. Fong Link kicked like a bay steer about our taking so much. He's nursed the stuff for years like a fond mother. But we had to have it for that effect up around the orchestra stand. Then he's been with you a long time? I caught at the chance for information on this chink, information that I'd found it impossible to get from the chink himself. Ever since I came in here. Chinamen, you know, not like Japs. Some loyalty. You can keep a good one for half a lifetime. We strolled back to the living room. The girls were there before us, Skeet picking out bits of plum blossoms and bunches of cherry bloom from a great bowl on the mantel and sticking them in Barbara's dark hair, wreath fashion. Best we could do at a splurge, she greeted us, was to turn in our blouses at the neck. And what in the world are you doing to Barbara? Mrs. Vandeman said sharply. Let her alone, Skeet. You'll make her look ridiculous. Skeet stuck out her tongue at her sister and went calmly on, mumbling as she worked. Ho till, ito Barbie child, you up at pretty man's and ho till. Over the mantel, in front of Barbara as she stood, her back to us all, hung an oil painting, one of those family groups, same old popper, same old mommer, and a fat baby in a white dress and a blue sash. At that it was good enough to show that the man had some resemblance to Vanneman as he leaned there on the mantel below it, rather encouraging Skeet's enterprise. From the other side I could see Barbara's glance go from man to picture. "'Doesn't it look like Van, Barbie?' Skeet kept up the conversation. Got the same ring and all, but it ain't Van. Him's the tootsie in there with the blue ribbon round his tummy. I say, Skeeter, lay off. Vandeman looked self-consciously from the painted ring in the picture to the real ring on his own well-kept hand there on the mantel edge. People aren't interested in family histories. I am, said Barbara unexpectedly. As the gong sounded and we all began to move toward the dining room, they were still on the subject and kept it up after we were seated. Fong Ling served us. The bride had worth on her right and talked to him in lowered tones. Barbara, between Vandeman and myself, continued to show an almost feverish attention to Vandeman. It was plain enough from where I sat that nothing Ina Vandeman could say gave the lad any less interest in his plate. But I suppose with a girl the mere fact of some other girl being allowed to show intentions counts. Did the flapper get what was going on, as she looked proudly across at her handiwork and demanded of me? Say, Mr. Boyne, you saw how Ina tried to do us dirt. And now, honest to goodness, hasn't Barbie with the plum blossoms got Ina and her artificial flowers scun a mile? I didn't wonder that young Mrs. Vandeman saved me the necessity of answering by taking her up. Skeet, you're too outrageous. There she sat quite a beauty in a very superior fashion, and Worth at her side was having his attention called to this dark young creature across the table, whose wonderful still fire, the white blossoms crowning her hair, might well have made even a lovelier than Ina Vandeman look insipid. And Worth did take his time admiring her. I saw that, but all he found to say was, "'Bobs, I suppose Jerry's told you that he's treed clayed at Tijuana.' No, said Barbara, he hasn't said a word. But I'm just as much surprised at Clate's being caught as I was at Skeel's escaping capture. 
Save it over and say it slow. Veneman was good-natured. Or rather, put it in plain American, so we all can understand. Mr. Boyne knows what I mean. Barbara gave me a faint smile. Mr. Boyne and I add up skeels and clate and get a different result, that's all. Bob's doesn't think that skeels is clate, caught or uncaught, Worth said briefly and went on eating his dinner. Apparently he didn't give a hang which way the fact turned out to be. Why don't you? Vandeman gave passing attention. She shook her head and put it. Skeels at liberty was quite possibly clate. Skeels captured cannot be clate. Mr. Boyne, do you call that a paradox? No, an unkind slam at a poor old man's ability in his profession. I started out to find a gang, but Clayton and Skeels are so exactly one, mentally, morally, and physically, that I don't see why we should seek further. Back up, Jerry. Worth tossed it over at me. Let Barbara, he didn't often use the girl's full name that way, give you a description of Clayt before you're so sure. How could I? The girl's tone was defensive. I never saw him. I want you, Worth paid no attention to her objections, to describe the man you thought you were asking for that day at the Gold Nugget, when Jerry butted in, and your ideas got lost in the excitement about Skeels. Deduce the description, I mean. Deduce it? Barbara spoke stiffly, incredulously, her glance going from Worth to the well-gowned, well-groomed woman beside him. I remember her moment of rebellion yesterday evening on the lawn, when she said so bitterly that if he asked it again she'd do it again, as she finished, Deduce? Here? Here and now. Worth's laconic answer sent the blood of healthy anger into her face, made her eyes shine, and it brought from Ina Vandeman a petulant, Oh, Worth! Please don't turn my dinner-table into a sideshow. Ina, dear. Vandeman raised his eyes at her, then quite the cordial host urging a guest to display talent. They say you're wonderful at that sort of thing, and I've never seen it. Barbara was mad for fair. Oh, very well. She spoke pointedly to Vandeman and left Worth out of it. If you think you'd really enjoy seeing me make a sideshow of Ina's dinner-table— she stopped and waited. Vandeman played up to the situation as he saw it, with one of his ready smiles. Worth threw no lifeline. Ina didn't think it worth while to apologize for her rudeness. Skeet was openly in a twitter of anticipation. There was nothing for me to do. A little commotion of skirts told us that she was drawing up her feet to sit cross-legged in her chair. She's going to! Oh, golly! Skeet chortled. Haven't seen Bobsy do one of those stunts since I was a child. Arms down, hands clasped, eyes growing bigger, face paling into snow, we watched her. To all but Vanneman, this was a more or less familiar performance. They took it rather as a matter of course. It was the Chinaman, coming in with the coffee tray, who seemed most strangely affected by it. He stopped where he was in the doorway, rigid, staring at our girl though with a changeful light in his eye that seemed to me to shift between an unreasonable admiration and an unreasonable fear. Orientals are superstitious, but what could the fellow be afraid of in the beautiful young thing, Buddha posed, blossoms in her hair? The girl had gone into her stunt with a sort of angry energy. He seemed to clutch himself to stillness for the brief time that it held. Only in the moment that she relaxed, and we knew that Barbara had concentrated, Barbara was Barbara again, did he move quietly forward, a decent, competent servant, stepping around the table, placing our cups. "'Just two facts to go on,' she said coldly. "'My results will be pretty general.' "'Nothing to go on in the way of a description of Clayt. I tried to help her out. I'd call that one we had of him as near nothing as it well could be. Yes, the nothingness of it was one of my facts.' she said and stopped. "'Let's hear what you did get, Bobs,' Worth prompted, and Skeet giggled, half under her breath, "'Speech! Speech!' At the Gold Nugget, whatever he called himself there, Edward Clayt was ten years younger than he had seemed at the bank. He appeared to weigh a dozen pounds more. Throughout his chest, walked with his head up, 
and therefore would have been estimated quite a bit taller. This personality was an opposite of the other. Bank clerk Clayt was demure, unobtrusive. This man wore loud patterns. The bank clerk was silent. This man talked to everyone around him, tilted his hat over one eye, smoked cigars just as those men were doing that day in the lobby. Acted like them, was one of them. In the gold nugget, Clayt was a very average gold nugget guest, don't you see? Commonplace there, just as the other Clayt had been commonplace in a bank or an office. Her voice ceased. On the silence it left, Worth spoke up quietly. Bullseye as usual, Bobs. Every word you say is true. And at the Gold Nugget, his name was Henry J. Brundage. He had room thirty on the top floor. Skeet clapped her hands, jumped up, and came around the table to kiss Barbara on the ear and tell her she was the most wonderfulest girl in the world. Heh! I flared at Worth. Find that all out today in San Francisco? No. Oh, it was the Brundage clue that took you south. Yep, left Louie on the job at the hotel while I was away. Today I went after Brundage's automobile. Found he kept one in a garage on Jackson Street. It's gone, of course, and no trace, Barbara murmured. Gone since the day of the bank theft, Worth nodded. He and the money went in it. Say, I leaned over toward him, wouldn't it have saved wear and tear if you told me at the first that you knew Scales couldn't be Clayt? Oh, but Jerry, you were so sure, and Scales wasn't possible for a minute, never in this little piking tin horn life. I don't believe I had seen Worth so happy since he was a boy playing detective. I glanced around and pulled myself up. We certainly weren't making ourselves very entertaining for the Vandemans. There they sat, at their own table, like handsome figureheads, smiling politely, pretending a decent interest. "'All this must be a bore to you people,' I apologized. "'Not at all, not at all,' Vandeman assured us. "'Well, then, if you don't mind, Worth, I'll go and use Vandeman's phone. Put my office wise to these Brundage clues of yours.' Worth nodded. No social scruples were his. I had by no means given up the belief that Skeels in jail at Tijuana would still turn out to be one of the gang. I had just got back to the table from my phoning when the doorbell rang. We saw the big Chinese slip noiselessly through the rear into the hall to answer it, coming back a moment later, announcing in his weighty, correct English, Two gentlemen calling, to see Captain Gilbert. Ask for me? Worth came to his feet in surprise. Who told them I was here? I do not know," the Chinaman spoke unnecessarily as Worth was crossing to the door. I did not ask them that. Use the living room, Worth, Vanneman called after him. We'll wait here. With the closing of the door, conversation languished. Even Skeet was quiet and seemed depressed. My ears were straining for any sound from in there. As I sat, hand dropped at my side, I suddenly felt under shelter of the screening tablecloth cold, nervous fingers slipped into mine. Barbara wasn't looking at me, but I gave her a quick glance as I pressed her gripping small hand encouragingly. She was turned toward Vandeman. Pale to the lips, her great eyes fixed on the eyes of our host, I saw with wonder how he slowly stirred a spoon about in his emptied coffee cup, and stared back at her with a face almost as colorless as her own. The bride glanced from one to the other of them, and spoke sharply. "'What's the matter with you two? You're not uneasy about Worth's callers, are you?' "'No, no, no!' Vanneman was the first to come out of it, responding to her voice a good deal as if she dashed cold water in his face, his eyes breaking away from Barbara's, his lips parted in a nervous smile. He ran a hand through his hair, an inelegant gesture for him at the table, and laughed a little. We ought to be in there," Barbara said to me, a curious stress in her voice. "'How funny you talk, Barbie,' Skeet quavered. "'What do you think's wrong?' And Ina spoke decidedly. "'Worth is one person in the world who can certainly take care of himself, and would rather be let alone.' "'If you think there is anything we should do,' Vanneman began anxiously, and Skeet took a look around at our faces and fairly wailed. 
What is it? What's the matter? What do you think they're doing to Worth in there, Barbie? I think they were arresting him, Barbara said in a low, choked tone. Only they don't know. Arresting him? I broke in on her, startled, getting halfway to my feet. Then, as remembrance came to me, sinking back with, Certainly not. The murderer of Thomas Gilbert is already in the county jail. I arrested Eddie Hughes this morning. You arrested Eddie Hughes? It was a cry from Barbara. The cold little hand was jerked from mine. Twisting around in her chair, she stared at me with a look that made me cold. Then you've moved those two steel bolts for Cummings. I jumped to my feet. On the instant the door opened, and in it stood Worth, steady enough, but his brown tanned face was strangely bleached. Jerry, he spoke briefly, I want you. The sheriff's come for me. End of chapter 25、26. Of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 26. Mrs. Bowman Speaks. Midnight in the sheriff's office at San Jose, and I had to telephone Barbara. She'd be waiting up for my message. The minute I heard her voice on the wire, I plugged in. Yes, 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 done all I could. A horse could do no more. They've got worth. I. The words stuck in my throat, but they had to come out. I left him in a cell. A sound came over the wire, whether speech or not, it was something I couldn't get. He's taking it like a man and a soldier, girl, I hurried. Not a word out of him about my having gone counter to his express orders, arrested Hughes, and pulled this thing over on us. Oh, Mr. Boyne, of course he wouldn't blame you. Neither would I. You acted for what you thought was his good. The others. Vandeman's already gone home. Tell you, he stood by well, Barbara, that tailor's dummy. Surprised me. No, no, didn't let Jim Edwards come with us. So broken up I didn't want him along. Only hurt our case over here, the way he is now. Your case? She spoke out clearly. What is the situation? A murder charge against Worth on the secret files. Hughes is out. Cummings got him. Took him, don't know where. Can't locate him. Do you need to? Perhaps not, Barbara. What I do need is someone who saw Thomas Gilbert alive that night after Worth left to go back to San Francisco. And if you had that, someone? If we could produce before Cummings one credible witness to that, it would mean an alibi. I'd have Worth out before morning. Then, Mr. Boyne, get to the Fremont House here as quickly as you can. Mr. Cummings is here. Get him out of bed if you have to. I'll bring the proof you need. But, child, I began, don't waste time talking. How long will it take you to get here? Half an hour? Oh, you may have to wait for me a little, but I'll surely come. Wait in Mr. Cummings' room. Half past twelve, when I reached the Fremont House, to find it all alight, its lobby and corridors surging with the crowd of Blossom Festival guests. Nobody much in the bar. Soft drinks held little interest. But in the upper halls, getting to Cummings' room, I passed more than one open door where the hip pocket cargoes were unloading, and was even hailed by name, with invitations to come in and partake. Cummings was still up. The first word he gave me was, Dykeman's here. Glad of it, I said. Bring him in. I want you both. It took a good deal of argument before he brought the western serial man from the adjoining room, where he had evidently been just getting ready for bed. He came to the conference resentful as a sore headed old bear. Maybe you think Worth Gilbert will sleep well tonight, in jail? I stopped him and instantly differentiated the two men before me. Cummings took it with an ugly little half smile. Dykeman rumpled his hair and bolstered his anger by shouting at me, This country'll go to the dogs if we make an exempt class of our returned soldiers. Break the laws, they'll have to take the consequences, just as a man that was too old or too sickly to fight would have to take 'em. If I'd done what Captain Gilbert's done, 
I wouldn't expect mercy. You mean, if you done what you say he's done, I countered. Nothing's proved yet. Nothing proved? Dykeman huddled in his chair and shivered. Cummings shook out an overcoat and helped him into it. He settled back with a protesting air of being about to leave us, and finished squeakily, didn't need to prove that he had Clayt's suitcase. Good Lord, Mr. Dykeman, you're not lending yourself to accuse a man like Worth Gilbert of so grave a crime as murder just because you found his ideas irregular, maybe reckless, in a matter of money. Don't answer, Dykeman. Cummings jumped in. Boeing's trying to get you to talk. The old chap stared at me doubtfully, then broke loose with a snort. See here, Boyne, you can't get away from it. Your man Gilbert has embarked on a criminal career, mixed up in the robbery of our bank, with Clayt to rob us. Had our own attorney go through the form of raising money to buy us off from the pursuit of Clayt. How about me? I stuck in the question as he paused for breath. Do you think Worth Gilbert would put me on the track of a man he didn't want found? Cummings cut in ahead to answer for him. Just the point. You've not done any good at the inquiry, never will, so long as you stand with Worth Gilbert. He needed a detective who would believe him through thick and thin, and he found such a man in you. I could not deny it when Dykeman yipped at me. Ain't that true? If it was anybody else, wouldn't you see the connection? Captain Gilbert came here to Santa Isabel that Saturday night, as we've got witnesses to testify, had a row with his father, we've got witnesses for that too, the word money passed between them again and again in that quarrel, and then the young man had the nerve to walk into our bank next morning with his father's entire holdings of our stock in Clayt's suitcase. Boyne, you're crazy. Maybe not, I said, reckoning on something human in Dykeman to appeal to. You see, I know where Worth got that suitcase. It came out of my office vault. Evidence we'd gathered in the Clayt hunt. Getting it and using it that way was his idea of humor, I suppose. Sounds fishy. Dykeman made an uncomfortable shift in his chair. But Cummings came close, and standing, hands rammed down in the pockets of his coat, let me have it savagely. Evidence, Boyne, is the only thing that would give you a license to rout men out at this time of night. New evidence. Have you got it? If not, wait. I preferred to stop him before he told me to get out. Wait. I looked at my watch. In the silence we could hear the words of a yawp from one of the noisy rooms when a passerby was hailed. There she goes! There! Look at the chickens! A minute later a tap sounded on the door. Cummings stood by while I opened it to Barbara, and a slender, veiled woman, taller by half a head in spite of bent shoulders and the droop of weakness which made the girl's supporting arm apparently necessary. At sight of them, Dykeman had come to his feet, biting off an exclamation, looking vainly around the bare room for chairs, then suggesting, Get some from my room, Boyne. I went through the connecting door to fetch a couple. When I came back, Barbara was still standing but her companion had sunk into the seat the shivering, uncomfortable old man offered, and Cummings was bringing a glass of water for her. She sipped it, still under the shield of her veil. This was never Ina Vandeman. Could it be that Barbara had dragged Mrs. Thornhill from her bed? I saw Barbara bend and whisper reassuringly. Then the veil was swept back. It caught and carried the hat with it from Laura Bowman's shining, copper-colored hair, and the doctor's wife sat there ghastly pale, evidently very weak, but more composed than I had ever seen her. "'I'm all right now,' she spoke very low. "'Miss Wallace,' Dykeman demanded harshly, "'who is this lady?' "'Mrs. Bowman.' Barbara looked her employer very straight in the eye. "'Hey,' he barked, "'any relation to Dr. Bowman, any connection with him?' "'His wife.' Cummings bent and mumbled to the older man for a moment. "'Laura,' Barbara said gently, "'this is Mr. Dykeman. You're to tell him and Mr. Cummings.' "'Yes,' breathed Mrs. Bowman. "'I'll tell them. I'm ready to tell anybody. There's nothing in dodging and hiding and being afraid. I'm done with it. Now, what is it you want to know?' 
Cummings' expression said plainer than words that they didn't want to know anything. They had their case fixed up and their man arrested, and they didn't wish to be disturbed. She went on quickly, of herself. I believe I was the last person who saw Mr. Gilbert alive. I must have been. I'd rushed over there, just as Ina told you, Mr. Boyne, between the reception and our getting off for San Francisco. All this concerns the early part of the evening, put in Cummings. Yes, but it concerns Worth, too. He was there when I came in. It was very painful. The quarrel between Captain Gilbert and his father, do you mean? Dykeman asked his first question. Mrs. Bowman nodded assent. Thomas went right on, before me, just as though I hadn't been there. Then, when it came my turn, he would have spoken out before Worth of, of my private affairs. That was his way. But I couldn't stand it. I went with Worth out to his machine. He had it in the back road. We talked there a little while, and Worth drove away, going fast, headed for San Francisco. And that was the last time you saw Thomas Gilbert alive? Cummings summed up for her. I hadn't finished, she objected mildly. After Worth was gone, I went back into the study and pleaded with Thomas for a long time. I pointed out to him that if I'd sinned, I'd certainly suffered, and what I asked was no more than the right any human being has, even if they may be so unfortunate as to be born a woman. Dykeman looked exquisitely miserable, but Cummings was only the lawyer getting rid of an unwanted witness as he warned her. Not the slightest need to go into your personal matters, Mrs. Bowman. We know them already. We knew also of your visit to Mr. Gilbert's study that night, and that you didn't go there alone. Had the testimony been of any importance to us, we'd have called in both you and James Edwards. I could see that her deep concern for another steadied Laura Bowman. How do you know all this? she demanded. Who told you? Your husband, Dr. Bowman. Up came the red in her face, her eyes shone with anger. He did follow me then. I thought I saw him creeping through the shrubbery on the lawn. He did follow you. He has told us of your being at the study, the two of you, when young Gilbert was there. See here, Cummings, I put in. If Bowman was around the place, then he knows that Worth left before the crime was committed. Why hasn't he told you so? He has, Cummings said neatly, and I felt as though something had slipped. Barbara kept a brave front, but Mrs. Bowman moaned audibly. And still you've charged Worth Gilbert? Why not Bowman himself? He was there. As much reason to suspect him as any of the others. Do you mean to tell me that you won't accept Mrs. Bowman's testimony? and Dr. Bowman's, as proving an alibi for Worth Gilbert? I'm ready to swear that he was at Tate's at five minutes past ten, was there continuously from that time until a little after midnight, when you yourself saw him there. A little past midnight. Cummings repeated my words half derisively. Not good enough, Boyne. We base our charge on the medical statement that Mr. Gilbert met his death in the small hours of Sunday morning. I looked away from Barbara. I couldn't bear her eye. After a stunned silence I asked, "'Whose? Who makes that statement?' "'His own physician. Dr. Bowman swears—' "'He—' Mrs. Bowman half rose from her chair. "'He'd swear to anything. I—' "'Don't say any more.' Cummings cut her off, and Dykeman mumbled, uh, "'The whole history of your marital infelicities all over the shop.' Too bad such things had to be dragged in. Man seems to be a worthy person. Dr. Bowman told me positively, I broke in, on the Sunday night the body was found, that death must have occurred before midnight. Gave that as his opinion. His opinion, then, Cummings corrected me. Yes, I accepted the correction. That was his opinion before he quarreled with Worth. Now he— "'Slandering Bowman won't get you anywhere, Boyne,' Cummings said. "'He wasn't here to testify at the inquest. Man alive, you know that nothing but sworn testimony counts?' "'I wouldn't believe that man's oath,' I said shortly. "'Think you'll find a jury, Will,' smirked Cummings, and Dykeman croaked in. 
A mighty credible witness! A mighty credible witness! While these pleasant remarks flew back and forth, a thumping and bumping had made itself heard in the hall. Now something came against our door, as though a large bundle had been thrown at the panels. The knob rattled, jerked, was turned, and a man appeared on the threshold, swaying unsteadily. Two others, who seemed to have been holding him back, let go all at once, and he lurched a step into the room. Dr. Anthony Bowman. A minute he stood blinking, staring, then he caught sight of his wife and bawled out, "'She's here all right. Told you she was here. Can't fool me. Saw her go pass in the hall.' I looked triumphantly at Dykeman and Cummings, their star witness, drunk as a lord. So far he seemed to have sensed nothing in the room but his wife. Without turning, he reached behind him and slammed the door in the faces of those who had brought him, then advanced weavingly on the woman with, "'Get up from there! Get your hat! I'll show you! You come long home with me! Ain't I your husband?' "'Dr. Bowman!' Peppery little old Dykeman spoke up from the depths of his chair. "'Your wife was brought here to a—to a—' to a "'Meeting,' Cummings supplied hastily. "'Huh?' Bowman wheeled and saw us. "'Why, didn't know so many gentlemen here.' "'Yes,' the lawyer put a hand on his shoulder. "'Conference. Over the evidence in the Gilbert case. No time like the present for you to say—' "'Hold on a minute.' Bowman raised a hand with dignity. "'Cummings,' said Dykeman disgustedly, "'the man's drunk.' "'No, no,' owlishly, "'not intoxicated. Overcome with motion.' He took a brace. "'That woman there, if she tell you, walk into hotel room, find her with three men, three of them.' "'How much of this are these ladies to stand for?' I demanded. "'Ladies!' Bowman roared suddenly. "'She's my wife! Where's the other man? Nothing against you, gentlemen. Where is he? I'll settle with him. Let that thing go long enough. Too long. Bring him out. I'll settle him now!' He dropped heavily into the chair coming shoved up behind him, stared around, drooped a bit, pulled himself together, and looked at us. Then his head went forward on his neck, a long breath sounded. "'And you'll keep Worth Gilbert in jail, run the risk of a suit for false imprisonment, on that?' I wanted to know. "'And plenty more,' the lawyer held steady, but I saw his uneasiness with every snore Bowman drew. Barber crossed to speak low and earnestly to Dykeman. I heard most of his answer, shaken, but disposed to hang on. Girl like you is too much influenced by the man in the case. Hero worship, all that sort of thing. An outlaw is an outlaw. This isn't a personal matter. Mr. Cummings and I are merely doing our duty as good citizens. At that, I think it possible that Dykeman would have listened to reason. It was Cummings who broke in uncontrollably. Barbara Wallace, I was your father's friend. I'm yours, if you'll let me be. I can't stand by while you entangle yourself with a criminal like Worth Gilbert. For your sake, if for no other reason, I would be determined to show him up as what he is, a thief, and his father's murderer." Silence in the room, except the irregular snoring of Bowman, a rustle and a deeply taken breath now and again where Mrs. Bowman sat, her head bent, quietly weeping. On this, Barbara, who spoke out clearly, those were the last words you will ever say to me, Mr. Cummings, unless you should some time be man enough to take back your aspersions and apologize for them." He gave ground instantly. I had not thought that dry voice of his could contain what now came into it. "'Barbara, I didn't mean—you don't understand—' But without turning her head, she spoke to me. "'Mr. Boyne, will you take Laura and me home?' gathering up Mrs. Bowman's hat and veil, shaking the latter out, getting her charge ready as a mother might a child. She's not going back to him, ever again. Her glance passed over the sleeping lump of a man in his chair. Sarah'll make a place for her at our house tonight. See here, Cummings got between us and the door. I can't let you go like this. I feel—Mr. Dykeman, 
Barbara turned quietly to her employer. Could we pass out through your room? Certainly. The little man was brisk to make a way for us. I want you to know, Miss Wallace, that I too feel... I too feel... I don't know what it was that Dykeman felt, but Cummings felt my rude elbow in his chest as I pushed him unceremoniously aside, and opened the door he had blocked, remarking, We go out as we came in. This way, Barbara. It was as I parted with the two of them at the Cape Hart gate that I drew out and handed Mrs. Bowman a small piece of dull blue silk, a round hole in it, such as a bullet or a cigarette might have made with— I guess you'll just have to forgive me that." I don't need to forgive it. Her gaze swam. I saw your mistake. But it was for Worth you were fighting even then. He's been so dear to me always. I'd have to love anyone for anything they did for his sake. End of chapter 26